Welcome. It's really good to have everybody here. This is my favorite event of the year. These events, the lectures that we have, are really special. These are about honoring traditions, honoring legends, and uh, Harry Seed is certainly a legend in our profession, and being able to honor him uh, is, is a tremendous honor for me. Steve, it's a tremendous honor to give you this seed medal. This afternoon, I'm going to talk about slope stability computations. And I'm going to get down into some of the, the details. Uh, hopefully, it'll all be understandable to you. It, it's what I sometimes refer to as getting down in the weeds. Uh, but um, just being California, I thought if I put getting down in the weeds up here, <laughs> they might think I was talking about getting down on the weed. And so uh, we'll just call it slope stability computations. <laughs> On a more serious note, it, it's an extreme honor to me to receive the Seed Medal. Uh, Professor Seed was one of my professors. I could talk for 50 minutes about his legacy. But one thing I was thinking about the other day that I think is really significant is 45 years ago when I was a student at Berkeley, he put together, I think, what's at least arguably the finest group of geotechnical engineers in education that there ever has been. And I find it quite interesting that three of the professors I had 45 years ago are here today. Uh, Jim Mitchell I saw at dinner last night. Um, Mike Duncan and Dick Goodman are both keynote speakers at this conference 45 years later. So I think it tells you something about the quality of the entire program at, at Berkeley, and certainly Harry Seed was instrumental in forming that program. So um, with that, let, let me move on. Um, I did try and think about what what were a couple of lessons that I thought I learned from Professor C? Maybe not so much in the classroom, but just observing how he did things. And I think when Professor C did an analysis, he knew what the answer was or should be before he ever did the analysis. And I think whenever we do analyses, we better have a pretty good idea of what to expect as an answer before we ever get a hold of that computer program and start to do an analysis. And so I certainly think that's one thing I learned from him. The other thing was know and remember your soil mechanics. You know, I almost feel to some extent when it was some number of years ago, soil mechanics and foundation engineering became geotechnical engineering, and then geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering. And I'm afraid maybe some soil mechanics got lost in that, at least in terms of what I see today. So. I'm not saying no one remember your geotechnical engineering. I'm talking about soil mechanics because I think it's so important. Now, I want to talk about four example slopes. These are all real problems that generally somebody else was analyzing, and then they came to me for one reason or another to, to look at. I'm also going to talk about three software programs. Uh, Slope W, which is from Geoslope International in Canada. Slide 6 from Rock Science in Canada. These are the most current versions. I think the most recent download I had for Slope W was November of last year, and for Slide it was January of this year. Both of those are from Canada. I, I think it may be something about the cold winters in, in Canada that you have a lot of time to write software. <laughs> the U Texas software, which is mine from Texas, I know a lot about the summers in Texas, and you also have a lot of time to write software because you don't want to go out in, in the repressive heat. So uh, these are the three programs. I find them to be the most widely used today in the United States when I see other people doing slope stability calculations. So I consider these really to be the, the dominant leaders as far as programs. In the slope stability analysis I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking about using Spencer's procedure for computing the factor of safety. I find that that works in 99% or better of the cases. Uh, we don't, you know, there's all these different methods out there, and people waste a lot of time fiddling around with those methods, but really Spencer's method pretty much takes care of most cases, and I'll show you some exceptions where we may want to worry about it, but that's going to be, when I talk about the factor of safety, it will be by that procedure. My first example, 
I call, they don't get much simpler because I think it looks on the surface as being a very simple example. It consists of a stone dike on about 15 feet of sand, uh, 23 feet of real soft clay and stronger material much, much deeper below the, the, the surface. The interest here is, is, is really in the possibility of a deeper seated failure. The factor of safety against a shallow slough or slide like that is one and a half. It's basically, it's basically an infinite slope and it's back of the envelope type calculation. So the real focus of the analysis I'm going to talk about is going to be deeper into the foundation. And when I got this problem, uh, a consulting engineer had analyzed it using what's known as a simplified Yanbu procedure. And I don't remember what program they used. It was quite a number of years ago, but I think it was a stable program. And they got a factor of safety of about 2.4. And they also had my program that had run this same problem with my program and done an analysis. And they got a factor of safety of 0.56. So, you know, those are quite a bit different numbers. And so they were perplexed by that as to why they would get such different numbers for the factor of safety. This is where I think we need to say stop. You know, these numbers are widely apart. Let's just have a reality check in all this because one program said it was 2.4, the other one said it was 25% of that, six tenths. Well, one way I like to think of this is if I have an embankment on soft clay and I'm worried about a bearing failure, let's just, let's just take this sand out and assume we've got all clay that's real soft. And rather than this triangular load, just a rectangular load like this, so we'd have a little under 900 PSF distributed load on the surface. Think of it as a bearing capacity problem. We all know how to solve those kind of problems. And with, with a 900 PSF bearing pressure, 200 PSF clay, the, the bearing capacity is a little over 1,000 PSF. If we calculate a factor of safety by relating the bearing capacity to the applied load, the factor of safety should have been at least one. 0.56 just doesn't make any sense at all. So we've got to say, well, what went wrong? I mean, you know, that was U Texas, and U Texas is always right. You know, what went wrong? <laughs> Well, this is what we had, but what we discovered was for that particular circle, there's two answers. We're solving a set of fairly in complex equations. There's nothing that says there's only one root to those equations. There's, in fact, two answers for that slip surface. You know, I mean, what factor of safety do you want? Do you want to say it failed or do you want to say it's okay? Pick your number. One answer is 0.56 and one is 3.35. They're both mathematically correct solutions for the factor of safety for the slip surface. So we would suspect that maybe this one's more correct since 0.56 is far below what we would expect is an acceptable factor of safety. Well, we have to look at that solution for 0.56 because I didn't show you everything. And one of the things that I feel is absolutely essential when you do a slope stability analysis is to look at the distribution of stresses along that surface. I automatically plot that. I won't do a slope stability analysis unless I can see that. And, and green here represents a compressive stress. Red here represents a tensile stress here. So this whole portion of the slip surface was in tension from that solution with 0.56. And if we say the shear strength in that sand is the product of the effective stress times the tangent of the friction angle, and we have a negative effective stress, we now have negative shear strength. So mathematically, while it's a correct solution, all of the strength of the sand was actually act acting as a driving force. It wasn't a resisting force at all. So it's a nonsensical solution. We know that can't be a correct solution. Our back of the envelope bearing capacity solution suggested it was, it was a nonsensical solution. So let's turn and look at what some other programs gave us as an answer to this problem. I recently ran Slope W. Uh, it analyzed a little over 10,000 trial circles. I set up a fairly, fairly complete search. But the thing that I think is significant is of the 10,000 trial circles that were attempted, over 7,500 of those, it couldn't even solve the equations for the factor of safety. So I'm kind of left in the dark on that. I ran slide, and the factor of safety was a little bit less, 2.6. Uh, about 13,000 trial circles. It was a little bit different in the way you set up the search. So it was more. But over 8,000 of the circles that were attempted, 
it couldn't solve for the factor safety. And it didn't really tell me why in large part on these. I got some clues from some of it, but the information. So 61% were failures. So I don't, you know, it makes me a little nervous to accept this as a factor safety. I went back and I re-ran you Texas and again did a search and such. But what I was able to do is I said, well, if this tension, I'm not going to have negative shear strength. I'll just set the shear strength to zero if there's tension. And that's a very good way of dealing with this kind of problem. And I got a factor of safety of 2.57, a little over 10,000 trial circles, 1,600 that it couldn't solve the equations, but that's only 16%. It still makes you kind of wonder, you know, what about all of these that it gave up on? So we're looking at factors of safety that are all pretty similar, but there were a number that we didn't get an answer to, so we have to wonder what might be the solution. Well, the one thing I, I, we can always do is for this kind of problem, this is a classical problem, incidentally. If you go back and you look at the proceedings from the 1966 conference, Whitman and Bailey pointed out when you have slip surfaces exiting steeply through cohesion, this material, you get tension and you have to deal with it in one way or another. I mean, so this is nothing new. To, but one thing that's interesting is to look at the old ordinary methods of slices where you do not have this problem. So I re-ran this problem with the ordinary method of slices all three programs. I got the same answer from all three. And this is typically what you find. If there's not a problem with your analysis and what you're doing is reasonable, it doesn't matter which one of these three programs you use. If you use them right, you get the same answer from all three of them. And this is an example of that. Now, this is a much lower factor of safety, but this is generally considered to be a pretty conservative method. What were the conclusions from this example? Well, multiple solutions or routes exist for the stability equations. There's more than one answer. I showed one was, what, 0.56 and one was three something. So there's more than one answer. The value for the factor of safety can be uncertain. I couldn't give you a number to even one decimal place and said your factor of safety is this. But I've got an idea what the values are, and I think that subject slope is stable because even with the most conservative method, I had a factor of safety of nearly one and a half. So I'm not going to worry about it. I don't know the factor of safety that precisely, but I go away thinking that slope's going to be stable. I don't have anything to worry about. Okay, example number two. Example number two I called she missed the seepage class. <laughs> And, and this was an example that was sent to me by an engineer who I asked to send me a typical example of a slope stability analysis they were doing, and they were using slope W. This is the example, and I, it, it, the, there's a dike or levee here on a stratified deposit. All the gray materials are relatively permeable, sands, permeable materials. The dark brown was referred to as a blank material, it's a finer grain material. This is the example. And they ran a seepage analysis with SEEPW. They had 13,657 nodal points in their finite element mesh. So I think it was probably a pretty detailed solution that they had performed. And then the pore pressures that were calculated from this seepage analysis were put into a slope stability analysis, a fairly calm and straightforward thing for us to do. When they did that, they got a factor of safety of about 0.6. Uh, I was kind of puzzled because I thought, well, if that's a typical problem that you're solving, you must have a lot of slope problems if the typical slope factor of safety is 6 tenths. So as I often do when I get another problem from somebody else, I, I, the first thing I'll do is I'll analyze the same conditions they analyze. So I reanalyzed this using their same pore pressures and everything, that same circle with you, Texas. I got the same answer. So that's, I feel, well, that's a reasonable answer to get. And I looked at it a little more closely. Again, I did, I kind of held some things back here. Again, I plotted the stresses along the slip surface. This whole zone was in tension. Now you could say, well, that was like the last problem. I had tension to throw a slip. It's, it's not now. This slip surface is much, much flatter where it exits, okay? The kind of problem that we saw on the previous slide should not have occurred here. So I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Let me, let me look a little more closely. So I said, well, I'm going to go back and look at their seepage analysis, and I'm going to look and focus right in near the toe of the slope on the results of their seepage analysis. And I want to look at two nodal points. One nodal point A, which is immediately at the toe of the slope, and nodal point B, which is directly below that at the bottom of this blanket layer. The total head at the top is 13 feet. The total head at the bottom 
is just under 22 feet. Two points are spaced seven and a half feet apart. Okay, to summarize, the head's 13 here, 21.9 here, so the head drop is 8.9 feet. The distance is seven and a half feet. I think we all learned in our first Soil McLean course how to calculate a hydraulic gradient, which is head loss over the distance. So hydraulic gradient's 1.2, that seems, well, that's pretty high. Then I looked at the blanket material. The blanket material had a unit weight of about 72 pounds per cubic foot. When I first saw this, I thought, well, I used a submerged unit weight, but no, all the other materials had unit weights of like 125, 130 or so, so this presumably was the total unit weight of that material. We can all calculate a critical hydraulic gradient, I think. We take the buoyant unit weight and divide it by the unit weight of water here, and the, the, the critical hydraulic gradient's 0.15. So the critical gradient's 0.15, and the actual gradient's 1.2. Why would anybody try and do a slope stability analysis if those were the gradients? You know, it makes no sense at all. It's just complete nonsense. It's somebody, but, you know, they just turned the crank. They got the seepage analysis and bang into the, into the pore pressure analysis. So, so what are the conclusions I can draw here? Well, first of all, I will say that integration of a seepage analysis and the slope stability analysis is convenient. You run one program and those pore pressures go directly into the other. But, but I'm, I'm raising a question here, maybe it's too convenient because people are not looking at the results of the seepage analysis. They're just turning the crank. And, and the, the second point, no one remember your slow mechanics. I mean, they should never have been doing a slope stability analysis for this problem, but they were. Okay, example three. Example three is, is panhandling okay? And this again is a, is a levy problem, although the, well, the previous problem was basically long term, they were using effective stresses, drain strengths with poor pressures. This was one where they were evaluating the short term stability using uh, undrained strengths for the clays. It was a stratified clay deposit here. This gray is the only permeable cohesion this material, the rest are all fairly fine grained materials. And they also had a level, if this magenta over here, across here, a level of high strength reinforcement that was used to, to stabilize the levees of sufficiently high strength that failure through the reinforcement wasn't expected. And this was the critical slip surface that had been found. Actually, I, this is not the one, the original one, the factor of safety was 1.8 something, but you really have to watch these programs in finding critical slip surfaces where there are odd shapes like this. So, so I worked with it. I think a better answer would be to say that the factor of safety for that slip surface was 1.72. I ran that same identical slip surface with U Texas. And again, this is what I always do, try and, try and do the same analysis. I got 1.73, essentially the same, which is really kind of surprising because the strength in these clay layers varied not only vertically but laterally. So it was a fairly complex variation that both programs had to deal with in this analysis. And so I got 1.73 and I said, well, I got, you know, I must be analyzing the same problem they'd analyzed. And then I ran it with U Texas and I got 1.45 for the factors. That's a big difference from 1.73 to 1.45. So the question again was, and when I first analyzed this, I thought, well, slope W just isn't very good at finding critical slip surface. And some years later, actually in working on another problem, I finally discovered what was going on here. So we're looking at these kind of differences in factor safety, which are significant. If your target factor safety is 1.5, U-Texas indicates you're not quite there. Slope W would indicate, yeah, you're fine. Now, this is kind of an odd slip surface because it has not only a convex portion, but a concave portion. And this, this sticking out here is what the Corps of Engineers termed a panhandle for the slip surface. That was a term that they used to, it kind of looks like a handle on a pan if this is a pan and that's the handle stay out. So that's where the pan handle comes from. But the important thing is to notice this is kind of unusual to have a concave slip surface. So going back and looking at the slope W analysis, here's this portion of the slip surface is concave and I want to look at that in some detail. And I want to look at two segments of the slip surface like this that form that concave. This is the bottom of one slice, this is the bottom of another slice. And that angle there is just under five degrees. So we might call that the angle of concavity, if you wish. Anyway, it's the amount that it's concave by 4.9 degrees. And here's what we finally discovered. Uh, slope W and slide impose restrictions 
on how concave the slip surface can be. Now, when you hit that restriction, unfortunately, it doesn't tell you you hit that restriction. It just quits. So these restrictions are in there, but you, you don't have any very good idea. We had to modify U-Texas to calculate all these concavity angles so we even knew what they were. Um, so, so this is a limitation. In slope W, the default limit on concavity is 5 degrees. Well, what do you know? That slip surface was 4.9 degrees. Apparently, it hit that limit of concavity that was imposed by the software, and that's what it thought was a critical slip surface. But unfortunately, I couldn't see any message, anything whatsoever, that that was, was the cause of it stopping. In slope W, you can change that limit if you know about it. You can change it to 30 degrees. That's the maximum you can change it. I don't know why just 30 degrees. That's the maximum you can change it. In this case, it was enough because we changed it to 30 degrees, and lo and behold, we get a slip surface that looks like this in factor safety 1.45. Same factor safety, both programs. When you do the analysis correctly and you're really comparing apples and apples, uh, I've done a lot of comparisons where we typically, in a lot of the work we did on Katrina, we compared factors of safety with two different programs to five thousandths in all cases. And when they didn't agree within five thousandths, we were doing something different in one analysis from another. Now, from a practical point of view, you don't care about five thousandths, but it is a flag that you're not, you're, com you're comparing two different analyses. You're doing something different, and you ought to at least know why. In the end, you're going to round off to one decimal place, but, but in, in comparing results and understanding what's happening, you have to look at much more. <clears throat> so, question is, is panhandling okay? Because we had this really odd shape of the slip surface. And the Corps of Engineers questioned that. Well, I don't know if that, that makes any sense. Well, fortunately, in this case, the Corps of Engineers ran a series of analyses. I believe they used FLAC. And what they did is they superimposed on contours of strain, and the highest zone of highest strain was along here, the slip surface for this problem that they got with U-Texas. And lo and behold, it's got that little, pan the, the scale's a lot different here, so it, it doesn't show up quite as much, but it's got that same hand-handled shape. So in this case, they confirmed what we found from the limit equilibrium analysis with flak analysis. We find that a lot. If you do a finite element analysis and a limit equilibrium analysis, and they're both right, you should get the same answer. We don't find there's a big discrepancy if you do the analysis right. This is what they concluded. These analyses indicated that non-classic shape failure mechanisms during hurricane storm surges, and that's kind of irrelevant, but storm surges may extend around the reinforcement on the flood slide. So they confirmed that that is a reasonable shape for the slip surface. And so what are our conclusions? Well, panhandling's okay for slope stability. Hmm? It's reasonable to get those kind of shapes. And I think the important lesson here is beware of defaults in these artificially imposed restrictions on slip surface. Philosophically, I have differences with a lot of the other programs on, on what they're doing. There's, there's restrictions put in those programs. They're hard to find out about. When you hit those limits, sometimes there's no message, no information you've hit that limit. I prefer to put no restrictions and live with what you get out of the program. So just be careful if you're using other programs. There may be built-in defaults and artificial restrictions that are going to affect the outcome, and you better, better be careful about about that. Okay, example four. Example four is Mike was right. And this is an example that was studied by uh, a graduate student at Virginia Tech, Mike Pekoski, and our Mike Duncan, uh, involving an anchored retaining wall. And there's a very good, many of you are probably familiar with a very good report that was put out by CGPR, Virginia Tech, detailing these analyses. They used a number of different programs and analyzed a number of examples. But this is probably the most challenging and interesting of the bunch. <clears throat> and here, here was a, a statement they made, and I think it's important to read it. 
This investigation has shown clearly that analysis of reinforced slopes is much more difficult than analysis of slopes without reinforcement. That's a very important point. I agree heartily with it. You're, you're, you're breaking new ground almost every time you go to analyze a reinforced slope, and you better be real careful about what's happening. In some cases, it is difficult to determine the factor of safety for a reinforced slope, even after the most exhaustive analysis. Example slope number six, that's the one I'm going to look at in this report, is such a case. I think that's a very important conclusion, and I, I agree with it wholeheartedly. Fortunately, I, I had the opportunity to work a little bit with Mike Pukoski when he was doing the study, and we exchanged some data files and analyses. So let's, let's see what happens here. Well, I, I decided it would be interesting to go back and reanalyze this problem, even though I'd done some with Mike Pukoski when he was doing his work. Uh, it had always been in the back of my mind, this is an interesting problem, one that I want to look at. So I went back and I set up a, an area, a, a grid area where I was going to locate center points in the search. It was a much finer grid than is, the grid that is shown here graphically, but basically this was the region of the trial center points for the circle. And I focused those circles through the toe point on the slope. This is what I was, was interested in, in looking at. Now here's another detail that I think is very important to recognize. In slope W, there's something that they call a tolerance. It's the desired difference in factor safety between any two iterations. When the difference in factor safety between two iterations is less than the tolerance, the solution is converged, and the iteration process stops. Let me, let me see if I can put this in simpler terms. Basically, in solving Spencer's method, or really any method but the ordinary method slices, you have to assume a factor of safety, then you plug it into these equations and you calculate one, and it's an iterative process, trial and error. So this tolerance represents the difference between the factor of safety you assumed and what you calculated on one iteration. And that, that is, is set in slope W. Slide also has something they call a tolerance. It's the same thing. It's worded a little differently. The tolerance is the difference in safety factor between two successive iterations of the limit equilibrium analysis procedure at which the solution is considered to have converged and the iteration process is stopped. The default value in slide is 5 one thousandths. That seems like a small number. In, in slope W, it's actually 1 one thousandths, the, the tolerance. So, I analyzed this retaining wall using the three programs. And I used the default tolerance, which is what you normally get. And then I reduced it, because I've used these programs enough that I know if I'm analyzing reinforced slope, the default tolerance isn't very good, quite frankly. And so I have to reduce it before I believe the answer at all. With slope W, the factor of safety went from 0.78 to 0.84. So that's a, that's a difference of what, uh, point si point oh 0.06, and the tolerance was 0 0.001. Well, the solution with a tolerance of 0 0.001 was 60 times out of, out of the correct solution compared to the tolerance. I mean, I, this, this solution's nowhere near one, within one one thousandths of this one. These differ by 60 thousandths with a tolerance set at one one thousandths. Same thing with slide. Little different answers here. Factor safety went from 0.69 to 0.77. So that's a difference of what? 0 0.08 with a tolerance of 0 0.005, okay? So if I set a tolerance of 0 0.005, that doesn't mean I have the factor safety to that accuracy. I'm not even close. You Texas, we've used tolerances for years that are so small, we calculate the factor of safety just routinely to uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 5, 1 times 10 to the minus 6. I mean, you don't even think about it because the tolerance is so small and, and the computer's so fast and the numerical scheme's so stable. Uh, if I changed the tolerance, it wouldn't change the answer. Here's the other thing that was real interesting. This theta is the inclination of the side forces in Spencer's procedure. That is, the forces that act between slices are inclined. And in Spencer's procedure, you assume that inclination is the same for every slice. 
Well, when we changed the tolerance in slope W, it went from negative 44 degrees, that means it was inclined at 44 degrees in one direction, to plus 39 degrees, it was inclined entirely in the opposite direction at nearly 40 degrees. So the side force inclination changed by 80 degrees when we changed the tolerance by that. Why is that? Well, it turns out, I think what happened here is this, this found one root to the equations, and this one was another root to the equations. I've already showed you, you can get more than one answer. I think that's what was happening. But why it happened when I changed the tolerance, I don't know, but it, it, it is kind of disturbing. So anyway, in the subsequent computations I'm going to show you, I use this reduced tolerance because I just don't believe the default are reliable at all. I wouldn't use them. <clears throat> These are the critical circles that I got with the three programs. Not only are the factors of safety different, those circles are quite a bit different, particularly the U-Texas is this kind of real shallow one, and these other two are, are deeper. They're nowhere near the same. So I get different factors of safety, different slip surface. And that's used in programs that I showed you a little bit ago. You get the same factor of safety with all three programs when you analyze the same problem. So something's really different here. And I think that's what Mike Bukowski saw. The factor of safety ranged from 0.54 to 0.84, big range in factor of safety. <clears throat> so it's time for a reality check, you know. What, what, what would make sense as an answer here? Well, one of the things I did is I said, well, this is, a, this is a kind of a retaining problem. What's the active earth pressure force? Well, that kind of depends on the assumptions about inclinations of the force. I really like to use a procedure like Spencer's for calculating earth pressures when I've got something that's a strata. I have three different materials and a water level up here, so this was actually calculated with Spencer's procedure, but it's classical uh, mechanics of active earth pressure. The active earth pressure was about 52 to 55 kips per lineal foot in the plane. And if I just take the horizontal component of the anchor force, it's 69. So my back of the envelope calculation I'd make is to say, okay, I'm going to take the horizontal anchor force and divide it by the active earth pressure, and that'll give me a factor of safety. Well, it's one and a quarter. All those other solutions I showed you, factor of safety 0.5, 0.6, 0.8, you know. So my reality check tells me, you know, the factor of safety may be greater than one for this problem. Those numbers, low numbers, don't make a lot of sense. Well, let's look at the problem parameters a little bit. These are the three materials. The friction angle here is 16 degrees, 20 degrees here, 20 degrees here. There's a little cohesion here, but it, it didn't have a big effect. So 16 to 20 degrees, and an anchor that's inclined at 30 degrees. So let's look at the face of the wall. I've got an anchor force inclined at 30 degrees on a plane that's got a friction angle of 16 to 20 degrees. Does that kind of tell you something? I mean, isn't that freshman physics a block sliding on a plane? If you, you incline a force at an angle that's steeper than, than your friction angle, it, it's going to fail along that plane right at the face of the slope. And in fact, you can calculate a factor of safety for sliding. It depends on how you assume this force gets distributed among the three materials. That's the reason I show a range here. But the factor of safety is about six tenths, maybe a little bit more, against sliding on that, that surface. So I can't apply a force at 30 degrees on that plane and expect it to be stable at all if I just look at the simple mechanics. And when I go back and look at my stability analysis, I think that's what U Texas was telling me. Look at how shallow that slip surface was. And I, I, I picked this grid and did that search. I could have pursued the search more because I ran out of grid space right here. So I imagine if I worked more, I'd get an even shallower surface. So U Texas was really telling me, hey, you know, it's failing at the wall, at the plane. That's a critical zone. You know, it's, it's block on a, a, a plane. You know, it's freshman physics. <clears throat> so. On problems like this, I found you really need to go back and rethink how you're applying the reinforcement forces in these limit equilibrium analysis. The traditional approach and what was used in all three analyses that I showed you previously is if I've got a, a slip surface and some slices and a, a reinforcing element like this, 
I apply a force, it's equal to, in this case, the tensile force in the reinforcement to the slip surface at that point. So it's, this slice here that's shown as slice three is going to have that force applied to it. And that's the way the programs typically deal with reinforcement in these slopes. And in all the three analysis I just showed you, that's what was being done. Well, if you think about the real problem, you've got an anchor with an unbonded length there. Actually, the force in that anchor is constant along that unbonded length, or at least more or less constant. We would expect not to be, see a lot of variation. And so if we re-look re at this problem, the reality, if I look at this slice three that I was applying the force to down here, that anchor goes clear through the slice, so on the other side of the slice where it comes out, I've got the same force acting in the opposite direction. I move to the second slice, that anchor goes through there, so I've got a force on the right and a force on the left. They're equal and opposite. So, so slices two and three really don't see any force due to the anchor at all. It's only this slice one where the anchor is tied off that's going to receive any force. And applying all of the force to this slice is really wrong. It's not the way those forces get applied. So if we look at the, re the reality, the net thing is this anchor force should be applied here at the wall. Well, yeah, but I just showed you if you put that anchor force on the plane, it was going to fail on that plane. Huh? So we're not quite there yet. We need to think a little more about this problem. This is what I showed. If I put that anchor force on the wall there, I'm going to have problems because it's going to slide along that face. But that's not really what's going to happen with an anchored wall. <clears throat> Let's look at that, anch that anchor force stuck here on the side of the slice. Well, it's got a horizontal component, and the horizontal component is going to be resisted by the soil. That's going to go into the soil as a force. But the vertical component of the anchor load is actually probably going to go mostly into the wall. And it's going to go into the wall and extend down below. Now, if you look at some of the guidelines for analyzing anchored walls, and I know I've talked to Dave Weatherby about this at length, they recommend doing the analysis with only the horizontal component of the anchor force because the vertical component of the force isn't really transferred to the soil mass, it's transferred down through the wall. The problem with just including the horizontal component is you've got to goober your, your slope stability program or put it on as a line load, which is equivalent to an infinitely long anchor. So it's not a real good way to do it, but, but at least it's better. But if you think about this, what we're able to do is not only do we put in the anchor here, but I'll add another wall element here, vertical element, and one of the things I do is I look at reinforcement. It's just a generic element in a slope stability analysis. It's, it's some element that's in there. It may have, oh, yeah. it may have, it may have longitudinal force. It can be compression or tensile, depending on the kind of element. Or it may carry some shear force. In the case of a wall, there might be some shear capacity down here at the toe of the wall. In this particular case, we didn't have details of the wall and the analysis that were being done didn't consider any shear capacity. So we just, I just put in a vertical wall element with a compressive force in it, and that automatically counterbalances the vertical component of the anchor force. And so now I do not have any vertical component of the anchor force getting transferred to the soil. It's all in, the, in this in this structural element that I put. So this is a lot more sensible approach, I think, to modeling it. And when we do that, factor safety goes to a little bit above one. Now, I'm still concerned a little bit because this big spike here is actually a tensile force at the toe of the wall. And, and so I'm still a little uncomfortable with this analysis even after doing all of that modification. And so I looked at this a little bit more, and I said, well, you know, there's a problem here. Because if I've got the anchor force applied here, this horizontal anchor force at this level, if I had a slip surface that went just a little bit below that anchor, it would cause a passive failure of the soil. I can't apply that horizontal anchor force at that point and have a stable situation. Now, when I'm looking at deeper circles, you know, I, for some reason, I sometimes think that these limit equilibrium 
and now she sort of have a sense that, you know, there's something going on wrong there. I think that's why I got some sort of odd answers. I think it kind of knew that there was something up here that wasn't quite stable. And, and, and so I can't apply that horizontal anchor force at that level as a concentrated force. I'm going to have a passive phase that's going to push the soil up the slope. So I really should rethink about how the horizontal anchor forces get applied to the soil along that wall. Now, I don't have a lot of details on this wall. I don't have any details on the wall. So at this point, one would really look at the wall and decide, judge better, what is a reasonable representation of how that anchor force gets, gets transmitted to the wall. But one of the things I did, I said, well, what happens if I just move the anchor down to the lower third point? You know, and just a simple triangular distribution. Lo and behold, with that factor, safety is 1.45. It's almost one and a half. Hmm? So the location of the anchor force here is very important in terms of the limit equilibrium analysis. And there's not enough information here about the wall to decide where's an appropriate force. But if you're doing one of these analyses, you need to think through that and decide where should this, this anchor force be applied, because it makes a big difference in this, this problem. Also, how you apply the force, applying it as a concentrated force at the slip surface is wrong. It's, it's not really the way the force is applied. It should be distributed among the slices in accordance with how the load varies along the anchor. So, <clears throat> so in this particular example, we started out with an initial set of analysis with a factor of safety between 0.5 and, and 0.8. And when we got through with the analysis and we really thought about what we were doing and we tried to represent what we think is a more reasonable distribution of loads and forces. The factor of safety is 1.45, which is adequate. And, and I'm not sure, but I think this was a real wall that was constructed like that and didn't fall down. So, so I, I tend to believe that that was probably uh, a representative answer. But you really have to think about these kind of details. <clears throat> so what are the conclusions from this? Well, again, beware of these tolerances, these built-in defaults in the program, the default parameters that control the iterations for the factor of safety. Even though one one thousandth, you say, well, that should be fine. I, you know, I don't know things to compute the factor of safety to within that kind of precision. But that, that, that one one thousandth tolerance that you put in the program doesn't mean that you've calculated the factor of safety to the nearest one one thousandth. It may be off by getting 60 times that, as I showed in that one case. So, so be careful. I, I don't like the tolerances that are default values in these programs. Um, and I would also say, you know, Mike Pekoski was right. These are very difficult problems to, to solve. But really, it's just soil mechanics. You, you know, what I showed you there was a little bit of freshman physics and, and first semester soil mechanics. I think there's nothing. You've got to think about what you're doing, but it's not rocket science. <clears throat> so what are the conclusions he can draw? Well, again, you know, know what a reasonable answer is. You know, back of the envelope check, you've got to have some idea what a reasonable answer is. You can't trust these programs to automatically give you the right answer. You've got to have some way of confirming it. No one remember your soil mechanics. These are the two things that Professor Seed taught me and I think are paramount to doing reasonable and correct analysis. The final thing, which, which is, is new, I think, is when I took soil mechanics 45 years ago, generally most of the slope stability analysis that were being done, you could probably check them by hand. We didn't have spreadsheet programs then, but even then with a, with a calculator, you could probably check those, those analyses by hand. Uh, now it's very difficult. I did some analyses. Uh, these were rapid drawdown analyses, which are fairly complex uh, for Duke Power's Bad Creek Pump Storage Project. And we needed to do a hand check because at that time, U Texas was the only program that would do these and do them correctly. So uh, FERC required that there be a check of the analysis. And, and um, I tried to get Duke Power to do it, but they, they finally prevailed on me to do the analysis. And I did them in the spreadsheet program. That spreadsheet program for one slip surface Analysis of rapid drawdown had 147 columns in it, and I had to use a minimum of over 40 slices due to the complexity of the geometry in order to capture all the detail in it. And it took several days to do an analysis for one slip surface. So it's very, very difficult to do hand calculations. They can be done, but I, I don't think it's economical for most firms to have engineers doing hand calculations, but you've got to check your results. 
And the only way I think you can check your results today is run another program. Uh, I've been involved, all the analyses we did for Katrina, we ran all of those analyses with UTexas and with Slide. Um, I was recently involved in a, in a very large uh, slope failure, still in litigation, so I can't tell you much about it, but we did those analyses with UTexas and with um, Slope W and also Gary Gregory's program. So we actually used three programs. And it was a lot of back and forth before we really felt that we had the right answer. And, and it's the only way you can check them is, is to run two different programs because hand calculations are pretty prohibitive. <clears throat> now, in the way of acknowledgments, uh, I'd like to, uh, people sometimes ask me, well, do you guys at, at uh, Geoslope or at Rock Science talk to each other? You know, do you ever talk to each other? And we're really pretty good friends. Uh, and, and so I'd like to acknowledge John Cron, who's the main one I've deal, dealt with at, at Geoslope. International. Um, I have their their program, the latest versions. They've been very helpful in, in supporting me on that. Uh, with Rock Science, Brent, Brent Corkum is a person I've dealt with a, a lot, and they've again have been very helpful. So I've I've got their programs and I run them a lot. And and finally, I'd like to mention Gary Gregory, who who has another program. And and as I say, Gary and I have worked on several projects recently and had opportunity to compare. So we know how close a comparison you can get if you truly solve the same problem. If you get a different answer, then you're probably solving two different problems, and you need to figure out what's different and whether it's important or not. It may not be important, the difference, but you better know what the difference is because it, it, it can't affect you. And I think that's it. So thank you very much for your attention.